I'm going to pray to get us started, and then we will dive right in. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, it is a, a heavy talk, topic to talk about suffering in marriage, um, and there are lots of stories represented in this room, and you know all of them. And so there is not a single woman whose story is unknown to you. And so Lord, we ask that you would help these women to feel seen and to feel loved and cared for by a God who is very present in times of trouble. Lord, we ask that you would be with us now and that you would be honored and gloried in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm Courtney. Thank you guys for coming this morning. I I, um, I live in Little Rock, and I am the mom of four boys. And one of the things, so suffering, I've been married for almost 12 years, and suffering has in some ways characterized our entire marriage and in a variety of ways. And so one of the things that we wanted to talk about briefly as we get started is what were the unique challenges to our last year. So I think everyone can probably say that suffering was universal in the last year for so many of us. And for us, COVID wasn't terribly, like the COVID, everything that happened with COVID wasn't terrible, except I was diagnosed with cervical cancer in April of last year. And, um, And so... While the pandemic didn't make our life horrible, um, cervical cancer made our life really, really hard. And so the last year was really challenging, particularly the last last spring and early summer as I went through um, surgery and recovery and walking through that with our kids. And so that's probably been the greatest challenge for us. But I wanted to ask everyone else. So Sarah, I'll go with you. Why don't you introduce yourself to us? Let us know who you are. And then what have been the unique challenges as you've walked through the last year? Yeah. So, you know, I think probably for most of you, you'd probably relate that this year was hard just because of all the things it brought. But it was also really hard because it just kind of intensified everything that was already there. You know, you were all home a lot more together. So any problems that were already there, it just kind of started to intensify those a bit. And that was very true for us. Um, Kind of similar to you, we have had a very long road. We've been married for almost 17 years. I'm married to Jeff. He was going to be here, but then I was like, it's going to be a lot of women. <laughs> so <laughs> he didn't come. Um, so we've been married 17 years. My, uh, We have uh, four kids, 13, 11, 9, and 7. Um, all are such blessings, but we have had a very hard road. Um, we've been given the calling of walking through a really, really tough special needs situation that is um, different than probably a lot of what you would be familiar with. And so it's made it quite a bit more lonely. Um, it's a, just a type of thing that consumes our life. It affects all of our kids, all of us. And so that was already been going on for over a decade. Um, and we've just had a lot of other trials the Lord has taken us through, um, through job losses, and I've had five ankle surgeries, and just things that it's kind of one of those when it comes in layers. So when this year hit, Suffering wasn't new to us, but it was that added element of um, everything else just kind of seemed, the heat went up in every area. And interestingly, we had been working on writing together through the storms together. (laughs) And then this happened, and we were going to be releasing a book smack dab in a pandemic. Um, And it just was interesting to see how the Lord even used what we'd been walking through as we wrote together in this process of working through grief and working through loss and working through all those various things that can touch our marriages. And the Lord actually really used that in our lives. But it was so hard. I mean, anybody who knows they have a special needs situation, we had kids come home for e-learning, which is just a joy. Um, And, you know, it's just, it's it's stressful. My husband was working from home. We had moved, uprooted from Chicago to Colorado in August in the middle of, you know, really right in the middle of COVID. And so all of that was, um, it was taking what we were already walking through and it just started to kind of um, build the pressure between us. And so it was a tough year. It really was a tough year. But I would say I was actually grateful for how much God's taken us through because it really did prepare us in many ways to navigate this better than we would have (laughs) many years ago. So I'm grateful for what we've been learning through it. I wouldn't say I'm grateful for it, but yeah. <laughs> well, I'm Jen Wilkin, and I have been married to Jeff for 28 years this summer. We have four children. Um, they are 25, 24, 23, and 21. And we also have a fifth semi adopted child <laughs> we picked up when she was 18, so we count her too. Um, and she is also my daughter Claire's age. So they're all right in a four year period. Um, 
age-wise. And the past year for us has been, um, I wouldn't say a time of, um, like where I would go, wow, that's the worst year we've had in a long time. Some parts of it have actually been really sweet. We've mm -hmm. had grown kids in and out unexpectedly. The, I think the losses for us over the last year have probably been pretty much what a lot of you have seen. Um, things like missed milestones, you know, college graduations and um, uh, other other family things that were supposed to have happened and didn't that, that we might not get to ever do uh, at this point. Um, we have had um, a tough diagnosis of a loved one over the last year, and we've been dealing with, we're at that age where we have um, young adult children who still have significant relational needs that we want to be meeting, and also aging parents who uh, have uh, increasing relational needs that we very much want to meet and be there for. And anyone in here who has been um, trying to love aging parents during a pandemic knows uh, the unique challenges that it has presented this year. I'm like, I cannot believe that I am now scolding you for your bad behavior. Uh, so, um, but it just feels very, very tender yeah. to have entered mm -hmm. that um, stage of life where you're like, and, and actually I, I had a taste of it earlier. My, my, my mom has a, um, has, a, has MS, and so she's actually dealt with a lot of this in the younger stages, but now it's kind of all starting to happen at once, that aging process. So that's been, I'd say, the biggest um, puzzle we've been trying to work this year, um, things that would have happened anyway, but because of the pandemic, it sort of accelerated some of the questions we needed to ask. Yeah. I'm Benita Reisner, and I have, um, I'm married to Joel. I have two daughters. Uh, 25 and 22, and I have two stepdaughters. So my story with marriage is I'm divorced, um, went through some pretty hard stuff in my first marriage, um, be happy to talk about later, and um, married to Joel for six years. And the pandemic has been hard for me in that I, you might have noticed I use a wheelchair a lot, and my arms and legs are getting weaker. So it's just that I need more help. and. I used to have friends that would come help me, and some of them do, but it's harder to get people to come help in the pandemic. But it was a real blessing, because my husband used to travel a lot, and he wasn't traveling during the pandemic. So that was really good for our marriage. Um, good and hard for him. I mean, he had to do everything for me, so he's probably happy I'm here with other people doing stuff. But um, So it, it, it was been, honestly, for us, a little bit of a sweet season for us to be together. Um, our kids are grown, although I have my oldest, my youngest graduated from college and moved home, and she's probably somewhat not enjoying living with us, so there's that. Well, um, the, one of the other things as we think about suffering in marriage is that there's a lot of different forms suffering can take, and so um, it can take, you know, loss of a child, it can take chronic disability and suffering, it can just take a variety of different forms. And so, Benita, I wonder if you could share with us, um, you've been open to share about your son Paul, and I wonder if you could share with us about how that shaped your marriage and also how that brought challenges to your marriage as well. Yeah. So I had a son who died when he was two months old, um, named Paul, and that was so hard on, um, on me, obviously, losing a son, and a doctor made a mistake, and that's why he died. So there was just a lot of struggle for my husband. This is my, um, my first husband. Dave and I just went through a lot, just trying to figure out how do we process this grief, and I think that was one of the hardest pieces is we process differently. And he was much more of an internal, like he didn't seem to show that he was really upset, which would really upset me because I felt like, are you not sad? Are you not grieving? And that was a source of tension for us because I am more of an external processor and I used to be a painter, so I was painting and doing all kinds of things and he just kind of withdrew. And that was really, it took a lot of talking to get through that and to realize like he's grieving too because I thought he'd sort of moved on. I mean, he'd go to the gym and go do things with his friends and I wasn't able to leave the house. And so that, that was something we really had to work through and talk about. I mean, I feel like communication is always the biggest thing in marriage and being able to talk about how are you feeling? And I was able to say once, like, it feels like you don't care. And Courtney and I had been talking about miscarriages, so I had four miscarriages also. And those were honestly really hard to maneuver in a marriage because 
I think the woman, it's your body. Like, you know everything that's happened. And I felt like Dave was kind of moved on pretty quickly and was like, okay, we can get pregnant again or whatever we would talk about. And I needed to grieve that. And I think for me, talking through it and saying, this is hard, that it doesn't seem that hard for you. And then for him to say, yeah, it is hard. I just, I express it differently. Yeah. So. That's helpful. The other aspect of suffering can come in the form of, as you alluded to, Sarah, chronic pain and, and disability. And so I wonder, can you offer some, how has that brought challenges to a marriage? And then can you offer some encouragement to people who are walking through disability, special needs, and even chronic pain in their marriages? Yeah, yeah um, I can't remember the stat, but chronic illness is incredibly prevalent. And actually, there's many people that have multiple chronic illnesses. And if you have that, often it's not visible. It is sometimes, but sometimes that's part of the challenge is it's not visible. So I was diagnosed with Lyme disease several years ago. I've been sick for much, much longer than that, but could not figure out what it was until after we had our fourth. And in the meantime, after, uh, throughout those years, all of our kids started exhibiting various symptoms, neurological, physical, and they eventually were all diagnosed with it. And um, I had no idea that it was something I could pass on to them through birth. And so it became a family journey so not only do I have to navigate my own pain, um, I'm trying to help them navigate theirs in, in a child's view, which is a different kind of thing to navigate. And so it has impacted our marriage. I think one of the things I've really struggled with is somewhat of a sense of guilt, um, both between my husband and I, not that he's putting that on me, but let's say we have a date planned, and all of a sudden I'm like, I'm so achy. I just, I'm going to be a miserable date if we go out. And I'll do it. I'll push through it. But I'm not going to probably be able to muster a smile. And so inside, I'm starting to be like, I'm such a loser of a wife. Like this poor guy, he, if he knew he was marrying a wife that felt bad all the time, he's like half my caretaker, half my husband. That's not fair to him. So over the years, I think the Lord has been teaching me more and more that God didn't just call me to this journey, but he called him to this journey. It is just as much his story and it's not my fault for making that his story. God knew this all along. So it's as much what God wants to do in him through it as it is through me. And so instead of it being something like, I'm the sick one, poor him, it could unify us instead, being like, this is a journey we've been called to walk through together. He's navigating, how do I do this and love her when I'm disappointed that we can't do this anymore? Or how do I comfort her when I don't even know how she's feeling? And I've had to learn, how do I communicate to him I'm feeling things you can't see right now. And so this distance I'm giving to you is not because I'm irritated with you, it's because I just feel horrid in the moment. So it takes, again, like you said, it's communication, but it's also starting to see the bigger picture of um, not just the specific of the suffering, but these things that the Lord gives us, it's a stripping away of something we want, something we, we see as a good thing for us. And so it takes that grieving process, it takes going through that. Um, but not only the communicating, it's also seeing it's something that it's not my identity. And that can be very tempting, especially if it's something you're navigating daily. It can somewhat consume your mind. And the same can be for our kids, where I can become the mom of, um, like our, our world can be about doctors and about sickness and about how we feel. And so between me not feeling well and them not feeling well, I can feel sucked of life sometimes. I can start losing who, I, who was I? I don't even remember anymore. I don't even know, do I have personality anymore? You know, and so it takes a lot of seeing that God has not given this to me or allowed this in my life to take good things from me. He just has more he wants to give me. And it comes through dying to myself first and accepting it. Gosh, so much of it is acceptance. I, I've just this week been thinking about how much I make my suffering so much worse when I think I deserve better. And it's so often my mindset. I'm like, I don't deserve this. Why is everybody else, they're out there, like they look so fine and they look so comfortable and their kids look so happy and comfortable. And Lord, why did you give this to us? But it doesn't take me long to also look at, my goodness, what has God done in my life and through my marriage and through my kids who are realizing this is not a hunky-dory world all the time. They're learning to grow up with the realization life is hard and where in the world am I gonna turn when it is? And so we're being given that privilege to help point them in that direction already um, as we try to do that in our own relationship with each other and learn how we navigate that and grieve together and all of that as well. So.
That's so good. The, as you think about loss, um, Vanitha alluded to that, and I think, and, and even Jen alluded to the loss of things throughout this last year. And I think we can all say that probably all of us have a story of some form of loss in this last year. And so I wonder also, Sarah, if you could speak to how loss or grief um, puts pressure on a relationship, and then how have you how have you learned to walk through those things together? Yeah. Well, kind of, you know, Vanitha touched on that a little bit. Um, I do think that has probably been one of the most crucial things I've had to learn walking through grief. Because like you said, we almost always grieve a little different than each other. Even woman to woman, we grieve differently. We have different personalities. We have different temperaments, different upbringings. All those things play a role in it. And so when we're also talking male-female, there's often different dynamics to that. And so we had a very similar thing where... Um, we had gone through some really, really hard stuff. We had all this stuff going on with our child at home, which was kind of like living in a war zone all the time. I was feeling sick all the time. My husband was on call for 10 years, 24 seven. So he was in and out, no matter what was happening in our home, no matter how bad of a situation it was. And then he lost his job after he left that job in order to save our family in essence. Then he lost the job that he had taken a faith to um, try to do what it seemed was best. So suddenly, we were a family of six, five of us with Lyme disease that no insurance covers. He had no income, we had, I, had, I was not working, and we had walked through basically war together. And we were kind of hit with this, um, kind of like if you step out of the war zone, all of a sudden you realize how horrible it was. You, when you're in it, sometimes you just keep going. And I, I had emotions just starting to go crazy in me I, that I didn't even know were there. And so I was deeply grieving, in some ways not even knowing what I was totally grieving because it was so broad. And he was like Mr. Stoic, um, diving into work, you know, watching and listening to me weep with this straight face. And, I'm, and I was starting to get kind of irritated with him. I'm like, well, it's not okay that you're not feeling my pain. Like, this is not okay. Um, and it finally took kind of a nasty... Um, a little bit of angry outburst, which I'm not proud of, but he's like, Sarah, I am hurting too. I am. I, one, I'm trying to help hold us together too. <laughs> like, if we both fall apart, this is going to be really hard. Um, but it did help to hear how he was grieving. Um, and it really helped that word picture. You know, if someone will say, if they lose something really that they love and is a big part of them, it's like losing a limb. Well, we have to think about that for our spouse as well. They are changed too. They've lost a part of them too, and they are trying to navigate that. So we're not going to be the same people anymore. We have to be willing to adapt and grow with one another, however that looks. It's not always going to look pretty. The healing process is not pretty. And so being able to do that ugly process with each other and giving each other so much grace within there, um, because we don't always do it perfectly. Um, and the other thing I just think is so important is we have to take our grief to Christ first. It can be... We want to connect with our husband, but we do not want to look to them to be our savior in those moments either. They will never fully enter into your grief. No matter how close you are, we've walked through very, very similar things. We've walked through most of it together, but he is not gonna be able to know what it feels like to be the mom in that moment with my child that I feel scared. He doesn't know what it feels like to be the mom trying to care for four kids while he's out working. He can want to as much as he wants, but the reality is, is he cannot fully know my pain. And so if I'm looking to him to get that comfort from him to fully understand me, it just frustrates me. It makes me feel more distant from him. So as the Lord's taught me to come to him as he is the only one that has truly been there with me every single moment. He's the only one that knows the wrestlings going on inside of me. Then it takes that weight and pressure off of Jeff to be that for me. And he can grieve. And then we can come together in that grief and so doing that and remembering this is a daily thing. I need to come back. Grief is not a one time. Anybody knows that. It is so cyclical. So I will be hit with it out of the blue. So to remember it, every time that happens, go back to Christ. Lord, I don't even know how to walk through this right now, but I need you to help me. I need you to help me remember what is true. Help me to be able to bring the pain I'm feeling that nobody else can see to you because I have to trust that you do see it and will give me what I need. And then go to my husband and be honest with him about what I'm wrestling with and let him into that journey as well. I love how you said that um, it's Christ that we have to lean on. And I think sometimes I, our suffering in our marriage has been largely related to like physical things that I've had and like surgeries and things like that. And usually it's related to birth. Um, Cause I always say like, like my, 
uh, birth was like set out to kill me, like just destroy me completely. And, um, and so my husband was always on the other side of it. Like he was always right there, but he was never the one experiencing it like physically. And when I was diagnosed with cancer in April, um, it was at the height of when COVID had just started and like you couldn't go into a hospital with somebody else. So I went to every oncology appointment, every PET scan, every surgery. I spent the night in the hospital alone. Um, and for every other surgery I'd had, Daniel had been with me when I was in the hospital with my fourth son. Like he never left. He was always there. And I shouldn't talk about this because it makes me cry. And there was a moment where I was like, there's no one who's here. Like, I don't, I'm in a hospital that I've never been in before. I'm with a doctor that I can't see his face. Like, I've never seen any of these people before. And I was terrified. But I, I can honestly say, and I'm not like an overly, like, I know I like, I'm a very emotional person, but I'm not like an overly, like, I felt the Lord, you know, type of person. And I can honestly say that in John 14, Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And I sense so deeply that the Lord was with me and that when no one else could be with me, when Daniel couldn't be with me, when no one else could be with me, the Lord was there and he hadn't left me. And I, I know I sometimes depend on him so much because he's had to be there. And I think also for us with grief and loss, um, I have often dealt with, um, your life would be better if you weren't married to me because I keep having these surgeries and you have to, like, you didn't have to deal with it. Also that you don't get it. Like you're not the one who's in pain. You're not the one who is hooked up to a machine. You're not the one who's having to recover from surgery again. And I read a really helpful book by Russ Ramsey called Struck. And he had um, a life-threatening um, heart condition that, that he almost died. And his wife wrote a chapter at the end. And she talked about, and he, and he talked about it throughout the book as well, about how even though your spouse is not the one who is suffering physically, they, they're with you. Like you are joined together by them in covenant before the Lord. And so the suffering that I had to remember and realize and co- over a long period of time, that even though he was, I've had two miscarriages as well, and even though he wasn't losing the baby physically, he was still suffering. Even though he was not the one having surgery, he was still suffering. And when I, it's, I'm a real slow learner, and it feels like the Lord just keeps giving me things to help me realize, like, don't you see that I'm with you? Don't you see that I care? But I had to see when I was in the hospital, like, my husband had to sit in the car waiting for a phone call from someone, and he was, I mean, he was as alone as I was, and the suffering was his suffering. It wasn't just my suffering. It was his as well. And so while we grieved differently, while we suffered differently, he didn't have his uterus taken out. I did. Um, that the loss is real, um, so and the loss has been significant for him as well. And so I've just had to. It's been a slow, slow process, but um, it's been comforting for me to realize that the Lord has always stood by me um, in our suffering. But one of the things too with um, marriage is another form of suffering that can be maybe suffering or difficulty that comes from good things. So Jen, I wonder as a as a mom um, and as a wife, how have you seen ministry challenges impact your marriage? Oh, gosh, ministry is the easiest thing in the world, so that has not been an issue in our lives. Um, Yeah, I think as it relates to my marriage in particular, so Jeff and I have sort of a weird, you know, there's not a ton of situations where the wife is the one who's in ministry and the husband is not. And my husband's had a long uh, career in uh, IT. That's what he does. And he serves in the children's ministry. And uh, he's only recently, he's gone to work for a nonprofit. So he's getting a little taste of what it's like to be in a, in a ministry world. I'm like, welcome. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, I've often said um, that I have had a very easy marriage to my husband. And my difficult marriage has been to the church. And uh, gosh, Um, the way he has stood by me in that. Um, And, you know, there's all these, when you're in ministry, how many of you are in ministry? Anybody in here? Yeah, that's what I figured. Um, And so you're not just carrying whatever's going on in your own life. You end up carrying the stories of so many other people. And um, some of them you're carrying because you're able to help and some of them you're carrying because you're not able to help and you're trying so hard or you're wondering um, what will open up for them. 
Jeff is so great. The question he will, and then there are all of the, just the normal challenges of being on staff at a church or, you know, whatever it is and the things you can't talk about and the things you can talk about. And sometimes you feel like you're living in a web of lies, not because you're telling lies, but because there are so many things that you're holding close because it's your job to hold them close, you know? And so that has its own level of stress to it. I'm actually a very upfront person. And so for me to hold things in is like, uh, you know, and, and so Jeff is the person who holds those things with me. He carries them with me. And he will always ask me on the worst days, he will say, what is your worst case scenario? And, uh, and he makes me say it. I have to say it out loud. Because um, even if my worst case scenario is truly bad, um, he can then help. We start to process through to like, OK, but is that really what's probably going to happen? You know, he's just able to talk me off the ledge really, really well. Um, and that's taken, um, I, I think it has been nice that he's not, uh, has not been directly involved in ministry, although he obviously knows most of the players at the church at this point because we've been there for 14 years. And, and it's not a situation of there being bad people. I, I work with wonderful people, and there are wonderful people in my church, but the weight of ministry and then to add a, add a platform to it has been another whole interesting piece. Um, but he has been a, he's been a true partner in that because he's really good at helping me quantify where the stress is coming from. And I think if you're a ministry wife, I think that's a wonderful gift you can give to a husband who's in ministry uh, to just be able to say, hey, what's your worst case scenario? And then talk through, you know, is that really what is the most likely thing to happen? Um, and how can you either enter into that space actively or how are we gonna pray differently as a result of the conversation that we just had? Um, and so much of ministry strain has to do with saying, I'm going to give it another month and I'm going to take its temperature again. I'm going to give it another two months. I'm going to take its temperature again. And that's another process that he's been a huge help to me with and might be something that if there are ministry wives in the room or women who are in ministry themselves who have a spouse that your spouse can help you um, just work through that process with. I'm always like, no sudden movements. That's what I always tell myself when there's a, just no sudden, just hold very still and see if something changes. It's my first, first step. That's awesome. Sarah, did you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I just, so kind of the other, the other side of it um, that I've seen a temptation in my marriage, or for me, um, especially when there's a lot of pressures coming in from various directions. Sometimes it's with ministry itself. Sometimes it's with outside things that we've been talking about already. And for me, that's what it's primarily been. And so when God started opening up ministry opportunities that I, at the time, I thought, this is not a good idea right now, Lord, because there's too much going on in life. I can't, I can't know if I can handle this. But as the Lord started leading me down a path that he was leading me, I started to see the, the blessings he had for me. The danger became when life was still really, really hard and when marriage was really, really hard, it became an escape for me. So I've really needed to be on guard that just because it's a good thing, it can also become an idol for me and it can be something that um, I'm avoiding what God's calling me to do in that moment because it looks like I'm doing something of value. And so for me, that can sometimes look like even at home. You know, now we can have access to ministry, per se, on our little phone anywhere we are. I can tap onto Instagram and post some encouraging something the Lord's teaching me, and I feel good, like I've contributed something. I'm using something God's doing. Well, in the meantime, my child in the background is throwing an absolute fit, screaming, breaking things, and I'm kind of like, this is so great. I'm offering you this stuff. Well, if anybody knew what was happening in my home, they'd be like, woman, get on that. So I have had to be really on guard for my own dangers, and that will be different for everybody. You know, you'll all, we'll all have our own temptations, but I think it's just been a, especially a subtle one because it is something God has been calling me to do, but that doesn't mean it's every moment of the day. <laughs> I also need to be aware that God's also called me to be present in the situation he's given me, and just because it feels really unfruitful at that time and it feels really uncomfortable, um, that's actually where my life is being laid down, as he calls me to. And if he uses that to then give me um, the encouragement and comfort he's giving me to then use that to also comfort and encourage others, I should not be skipping that part to go to what I want, I want the outcome to be. I need to do the hard thing and I need to be present where he wants me to be. And so I think that's something we will always struggle with. You know, there's always going to be those temptations. It's not like we 
completely cut off ministry because it's a temptation, but we have to fight the battle too and just be aware that it can be a battle at times, including in marriage. If I'm struggling with Jeff for something, I can feel fulfilled in ministry and almost use that as a substitute to fill what should be happening between the two of us. That's helpful. So I think we probably could all agree that um, suffering brings heat and brings conflict and brings difficulty. And sometimes suffering brings that we sin against one another, or sometimes we sin against one another and that brings suffering. And so Vanitha, can you speak to how suffer, how uh, forgiveness is an important part of marriage and maybe tell a little bit of your story of how the Lord worked through that? Yeah. So um, this is back to my first marriage to Dave. Um, just to give you a super brief thumbnail. Um, so he had an affair very early in our marriage and we worked through it and I'm gonna talk about that in a second, but, but he did have an affair that ended our marriage as well. So the first affair, I felt really called, like we went to counseling. I was pretty much thinking I was gonna be out of this marriage. Like I kind of had said, if somebody's gonna do that, I'm not gonna stay. And so we went to counseling, and I kind of had this attitude, like, I don't need to work on this. And yet God was working on my heart, like, you need to be open to this. And my husband, Dave, showed real signs of repentance. And that, that was a process. And I would say, you know, I'm guessing there's women in this room that are dealing with infidelity or things like that in your marriage. And I had three things that I felt like the Lord had kind of called me to say, you know, he needs to repent. He needs to be totally done with that relationship. And he needs to win you. And he really did that. Repentance has fruit. And I saw that in Dave. And we had 15 years of a great marriage. So I don't have any regrets. Even though that marriage ended in divorce, I have no regrets about staying and I learned so much through forgiveness. That was a process that we worked through. And I sort of made this covenant with God, which no, I, I, can't, I could not have done it in my own strength, honestly. But when I chose to say, I forgive you, I asked God to have me never bring that up again in an argument, in anger, in anything. I mean, we talk about it like he'd bring it up and in different contexts, but I never threw it back at him in an argument. And that, I think, was so helpful in our marriage. And it helped us, like, we had to regain trust because when somebody's broken your trust, you they need to regain it. And he worked really hard at regaining it. And I feel like um, in a marriage, when you have to go through something really hard and you have to forgive, there is so much closeness you have with that person. I mean, there's, you know, we think about how much Christ forgave us. And there was a lot of just, we love Christ for that. And I feel like that drew my husband and I together. Um, so we, I would say we had a, a very, very good marriage for a long time after we went through that super hard thing. And a lot of it, though, was going to the Lord, as we've all talked about. If, if Dave was the only um, if I did not have Christ, I would not have put that marriage back together. I, I would not have, because there were times when I would say, I can't do this. This is too hard. Don't ask me to do this, Lord. And I would just keep going back to God, and he would meet me every single time. And I found that forgiveness has changed my life. I mean, if anyone's read my memoir, that's really the pretty much the theme is forgiveness over and over, whether it's my husband or a doctor or different people. God has changed me through forgiveness. So I would say in marriage, and there's those, so that's a huge thing, but then we could all speak to forgiveness of, and everybody here knows, our, we aren't married to um, perfect people, and there's every day there's things we have to forgive each other for. And like my husband Joel has to forgive me a whole lot nowadays because I'm, I'm kind of crotchety, and yeah, so it's, it's the way marriage works. I always say that about my husband, I'm like, like, I think you and I were talking yesterday, and, and you said kind of the similar thing, and I was like, Daniel is like a saint. Yeah. <laughs> Mike <laughs> is. He's definitely the one in this marriage who forgives way better than his wife does. So, But Sarah, do you have anything to add? Um, you know, I think the only thing I want to add is there's a kind of a, a different side to the forgiveness that I think we really have to, I think, okay, so this was my favorite chapter in the book. It's called You Can't Change Your Spouse's Heart. And the reason it was my favorite is because I feel like it was the most pivotal change in our marriage. 
So we had walked through so many trials together. So we were doing really well, kind of as if we were both, you know, linked together as soldiers on a, a war field. We were functioning well in that. But there was so much happening under the surface, but we had so much bombarding us all the time, we really couldn't navigate it. And so when he had been on call for those years, I, he would leave for my birthday dinner. We'd be out and he'd have to leave and I'd go home and eat takeout and he'd leave on Christmas morning. And you know, but the worst things were when there was an episode happening with our child, it would often be a very scary situation and he would feel this tension. A doctor is calling me, I need to go, it's trauma, I need to be there. If I don't go, they may not use the, the whatever, implants I'm using. Um, and so he felt this pressure but I, in that situation, felt literally scared. I felt unable to do what was in front of me, and I'd watch him walk out the door. And I, had, I knew what we signed up for. I knew this was part of the job. But it took on a different level when I felt like he can leave when he wants, and I have to stay on the battlefield, and that's not fair. And that went on for years. Um, he is a wonderful, wonderful man, and he served me and loved me so well. But this was just a no-win situation. He had genuine pressures that he could lose that business, which would also affect our family. So it was a really unfair <laughs> situation. But this happened enough for me where I was in such a difficult place, and when I watched him walk out that door, to me that was, that was more important than me. And that happened enough years that when he stepped out of that job, all of a sudden the emotions of all those different times that that happened started to surface in ways I didn't even realize were there. And I started feeling angry and resentful and hurt, and I almost couldn't pinpoint why. And so we went through a really, really dark season of, um, I, I just so badly wanted him to know what it felt like. I wanted him to see me. I wanted him to know this is what I felt like in that moment, and I feel like you don't see that. You can't see what you left me with. And even though he knew, he regretted it, he wished he had changed, he made a different decision, there was something inside me that was like, how can we be unified if you have no idea the utter, I won't say it, that I've walked through? And so it was a really long season, and I would phrase things differently. I'd be like, maybe you just didn't get it the way I said it. So I'm gonna come at this angle. And every time I did that, I'd get more frustrated because he wasn't grasping the thing I wanted. Finally, the Lord, it was like one day after a really hard conversation and we were to the point where we were not able to talk without going to tears. I felt the Lord, it was just this like conviction from the Lord, stop trying to convince him to see you and realize that I see you. And it was a changing point for me. I stopped trying to beat Jeff over the head to get what I wanted him to get. And I started going to the Lord so consistently, realizing he was with me all those times. So I'm trying to convince the person that wasn't with me when the one who was with me and has what I most need is waiting for me. And so I started consistently going back to the word and praying and just asking him, Lord, I really need, I don't even know what I need, but you know what I need. And I just, I need to be comforted. I need to feel like I've been seen. And I need to stop taking my eyes off of him, off of Jeff. But what I did start to be able to do is pray, Lord, open his eyes to what you know he needs to see. Whatever that is. It may not be what I think he needs to see, but I want our marriage to be good. I want to feel unified, and I don't know how to do that apart from some of these walls coming down. And it was absolutely miraculous to see what happened. Little did I know Jeff was doing the same thing. And suddenly, conversation became fruitful. We were both stopped, we stopped trying to change each other. <laughs> we stopped trying to convince each other what we wanted them to get. And we both started bringing all that to the Lord first. And then we were able to hear each other all of a sudden. It was like the defenses came down. We weren't expecting everything from each other, so we were able to take little bits back and forth. And healing started to happen. I mean, it was just miraculous. And I think I needed to see that, that our marriage is not, it is not our job to change our spouse's heart. God wants our hearts to be before him first and foremost, and it is his job to change the hearts of our spouses as well. We can be a part of that. We should be mutually and encouraging each other, praying for our spouse, having those difficult conversations at times, but that can, cannot be where we first are going um, or we're doing it backwards and it never ends up well. <laughs> so, Oh, that's so helpful. So I, I think we can all agree that we want to grow in our marriages, so we don't want to stay the same. 
So can any, I'm gonna go through and just maybe each of you share maybe a tip or something that you've done that's helped grow your marriage, whether it's in the past year or just like one takeaway for a way that you've grown. So maybe Sarah, do you wanna go first? Sure. Um, you know, I think, I think it's been something God's been teaching me all along, but I think this year just kind of brought it all home a bit. This life is a process of our fingers being pried off of every little thing. And I, I, I naturally have the tendency to want to like grip it back. And the Lord keeps prying them back off. And I think it's showing me every time there's some, some sense of loss or something I was expecting and it didn't happen or disappointment or goal that fell apart or whatever it is, is it's always a temptation to put my hope in each one of those things. And they can be really good things. I want my children to flourish but that's not where my hope can be. I want my marriage to be good and solid and healthy, but that cannot be where my hope is. I want my health to get better. I can pursue a better health, but that can't be where my hope is. I mean, the list goes on and on. I want my son to be healed. It affects so much and it's just heartbreaking, but my hope can't be in his physical healing. And so as each of those things have been a loss, there's also been a freedom that came with it because you start realizing the Lord holds all those things in his hands. And I can grip them as tight as I want, but the more I grip them, the more pain they create. They don't create more freedom. And so I've seen it more and more as God's grace, difficult, painful, severe mercy, to take some of those good things away and let some of those be a disappointment and let some of those be the things that I thought would be my greatest joy, be my greatest sorrow at times. But uh, I don't remember who I was talking about, this with, but that there's always this parallel path of suffering and blessing running alongside each other. And sometimes it's hard to see the other path. Sometimes we're on that blessing path and we're really not really paying attention at all to the hard stuff. Sometimes we are just head down, so bombarded on that path of suffering, it's really hard to see anything other than that. But it's, it's taught me to start looking more more deeply and more intensely at where are God's grace is in here? Where is God's faithfulness being seen in this difficulty? And as that happens, you start realizing how those paths of joy and sorrow meet, how um, God wants for me now to live in light of eternity. And part of that is taking away the things I want to grip onto right now. And so it's, I've started just to see the gift a lot of that has been it's so hard, I grieve it every single day. I mean, the amount of pain I am faced with every day, it's so fresh, and it's extra fresh just even in the last few weeks. But I am continually having to go back and rehearse, what does God ultimately want for me? What does he ultimately want for my marriage? And I've had to be in the scripture every day. I mean, it's like a lifeline. If you don't, every other message of your brain and out in the world is gonna take over. And I could very easily lose hope. And apart from God's grace, I don't think I would be here. I don't think our marriage would be here. Um, and so I see it as his mercy. He doesn't just allow these things. He comes alongside us through them. And that's where the sweetness of his presence ends up being. And the gift that there is in marriage, when you both are broken down, and yet you're both in the same process of being built up in Christ, there's nothing sweeter. And it doesn't always happen that way. It's often at different times. It's messy. It's not like that in this perfect, harmonious way. Um, but it started to make me stop seeing suffering as the enemy in my marriage. It's actually been one of the greatest gifts we've been given. It's been horribly hard. I don't like the actual circumstances themselves. They are not good. But what God has done in them has been the greatest thing he could have given me. Um, and so my practical thing would simply be... be be in God's word every day. Do not, the suffering can become consuming in your life to where that's all you dwell on. And we do have to face it, but we have to face it through the lens of promises of God, through the scripture, and through what we ultimately see, his perspective of suffering. Otherwise, we feel like we got jilted. We drew the short straw. Um, and there's so much, so much blessing in it. And so that would be my prayer for all of you is that, Everybody in this room is facing something different. Everybody is. Nobody is free from pain in this world. And so instead of seeing that as like not being the kindness of God, flipping that around and saying, 
God wants me to see things. He does not want me to be ignorant to the things that are most important in this life. And he's willing, he loves me enough to allow pain into my life to take that facade away to give me something so much greater. And that's the same thing in our marriage. It can seem like difficulty can be the worst thing for our marriage. It can end up being what God is bringing to actually unify and strengthen your marriage more than anything else. What about y'all? Do you have anything? I would just say, you know, I think I've heard it said that what COVID has done is introduced all of us to what to, to this low-level uh, version of what people who suffer feel all the time. It's like we've been welcomed into a space that we yeah. didn't really think about before last year. And um, I've said all year long, right now, no one is their best version of themselves, uh, mm -hmm. it, especially being in leadership at a church. You know, it's like, gosh, you guys are super cranky um, <laughs> on, on both sides of everything. Uh, thank you for sharing your opinion with me. And... Um, but I think that that has played out in all of our relationships in, in various ways, and it's a, it's, a, it's a snapshot of what it looks like for people who go through deep suffering that they experience at amplified levels. And so I really want to be a good student of this past year, and um, I know that when hardship comes in my life, I want to control. It's like Sarah was saying, I'm like, I'm pre actually pretty good at controlling things. So why don't I just put into motion some of these things I use in other spaces to control relationships primarily. And uh, then I want to reach out to my spouse and say, and how can you partner with me in taking control of these things? And, and, and to have a spouse who's like, mm, I'm going to help you let go. I'm going to show you how you don't have control. And that's not always, um, you know, you don't always want to go on a date after those conversations. <laughs> and so I think my watchword, not just in my marriage, but in all of my primary relationships, what I want it to be uh, is to uh, genuinely like those people. And you genuinely like people who you affirm, you know, who you're like, I see this really great thing in you. And so whereas I'm given to critique, and I think even more so when I'm under stress, I'm going to press myself. I'm going to pray to the Lord to give me um, the, the, the greater ability to speak words of life and affirmation uh, to those who I'm closest to. Obviously, you want to do that to everyone. But if I'm going to go through hard times, I want to do it with someone I really like. And yes, love, but I really like Jeff. And um, I really want that to be something I am nurturing and feeding, even when things are not ideal, because things are rarely ideal. And um, wherever this takes us, I want to be with this person I really like and, and care about. And so that means I'm going to need to lean. And I've seen in my kids, and I've seen in, in Jeff too, like for what, you know, we all just have needed to hear that more. I've needed to hear it more. You still love me and like me, right? And so that's, that's the takeaway I want, um, not just from this year, but just looking back over the years of when things have been hard is I want to keep investing in if whatever we're going to go through. I really like you. It's been fun, actually, with kids who are getting to marriage age, and they're weighing, like, oh, what, who, who is the right partner? You know, and, and gosh, in, in young adult marriage conversations right now. There's a lot of super weird stuff going on in Christian <laughs> subculture. Can we just say that? And I'm like, you know, Jeff and I are sitting back and we're like, well, they really like each other. And that feels more important to me than some of the other things that they're concerned about, you know? So I try to remind myself about that too. It's just, I want to keep investing in that. Man, I, I really like you. Let's, let's do whatever's next together. Uh, yeah. um, I would say probably two things. For me, it's really praying for myself first. Because I feel like I spent a lot of years praying for my husband. I had a million lists of what I wanted to see changed. And sort of what you had said, Sarah, um, I think God really showed me I'm the one that needs to change in a lot of ways. I have no control over changing my husband. And certainly God calls us to pray for our husbands. But I realized I wasn't working on my stuff. And I think I always thought it was somebody else's fault. I, I feel like that in every relationship. But, you know, people say I'm the common denominator in the problems in my relationship, so, which is true. So I always kind of think somebody else needs to change just a tiny bit. And I feel like the Lord keeps bringing that to mind. Like, I have a prayer card. It is the, I mean, I pray, 
I have a card for repentance every morning, and I feel like I ask God to show me what do I need to repent of. And then my next prayer card is me. And I have a lot of things that I need to work on. You probably have shorter cards. Mine is very long. And I just ask God because I see that I have that spirit of entitlement. And if you have a disability, it's kind of easy to feel like, hey, this is harder for me. So maybe you need to be serving me. Subtle ways, you know, it's hard for me sometimes to do things. And, but my husband's busy. And somehow I feel like, well, you know, it's hard for me. You need to come serve me. And I feel like God keeps reorienting me to sometimes you need to die to self. And sometimes you don't get things exactly the way you want them. Um, Johnny Erickson Tata has this great thing where she says, I don't get anything the way I want it. But every time I don't, that is something I can offer to God and it will shine in glory one day. So the things that aren't fixed, they are going to shine in glory. So I would say pray for yourself and then pray for your spouse. And then um, one thing, I, I had mentioned it on a panel, I was a few days ago, but suffering has been this amazing gift in my life. And part of it is this analogy I came up with just a little while ago, which was this life is like wrapping paper. And we all look at other people's wrapping paper and we say, wow, they have great kids. I mean, I've always idolized these wonderful, obedient, yes mom kids and did not have them. They're wonderful kids. but. <laughs> Um, and I would look at everybody else's marriages, their children, their ministry, and I would be looking at the bows on their wrapping paper like, I want that wrapping paper. And when you suffer, God tears the wrapping paper. Like your marriage is torn. Your idea of a perfect life is torn. But you realize wrapping paper wraps a gift, and the gift is God. And when your wrapping paper is torn, you will see Jesus in a way that you will never see him with full, beautiful paper. And so that's why I think suffering in marriage, in parenting, and everything can be this amazing gift because we can't look to our spouse or our children to fill us. It's God, and that he is the gift. And I think when people have beautiful wrapping paper that's never torn, they don't appreciate that there's a gift there. So I would say in our marriages, there's a gift. If it's a struggle, there's a gift of Jesus that you are going to see more. Yeah. Well, my goodness, there's like no better way to close than the words that Christ gives us that is exactly what you're talking about. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction, which never feels light or momentary, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We have time for questions. So if anyone... Be very kind in your questions, yes. please. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could offer some advice when you're facing a situation where your husband uh, feels a decision needs to go one direction, and you genuinely don't agree. <laughs> um, and so we're called into submission, but you have to walk through this season of how do you navigate what you're thinking. So I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. if anybody could speak into yeah. We asked you to be kind husband. in your questions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Not> kind. <laughs> Jen, you're super wise. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh wow. Oh, yeah, that's a mission like question. The two that's people a who've been married longer one. should answer the question. <laughs> uh, yeah, honestly, that that's a really tough question to answer on uh, in this format because I would have about forty-five follow-up questions. It really depends on what the decision is and the nature of what you're being asked to agree to. Um, is it something that is morally neutral or something that has a moral uh, tinge to it? Um, and so it's a difficult one to answer from a platform. Obviously, there are issues in which you would not want to submit if it's an ungodly request. Um, but if there are, uh, if it's something where it's just a decision in the routine um, course of life, um, you should have good dialogue around it, assuming you have that health in your marriage relationship. And then at some point, you just step away. And you, and I think the most important piece is. 
if you were right on the other side of it? Uh, how are you going to school your response? You know, or is it going to be a man? I I told you so. Or is it going to be a silent? I told you so, you know? And so I think there's assuming that it was just a decision where someone needed to make the call and you felt strongly that the call that was made was not the one you would have made. You got to really prepare yourself for if you're right as much as for if you're wrong. Uh, and then I would say when it comes to decision making in a marriage, uh, most of the healthiest marriages that I've come across in ministry are not ones where the husband holds the power of veto in all decisions. They're ones in which there's been an honest analysis of who has different strengths and weaknesses in the marriage, and certain decisions are carried with more weight by the, mer- the, the member of the marriage who actually has maybe a better vantage point on them. Uh, now, that can be hard if that's not a shared assumption in your marriage, and, and you're like, I am actually the one who has a better vantage point on that. Or maybe you're just not self-aware and you think you have a better vantage point in every single decision that's coming along. I'm not talking about myself, for sure. I'm talking about other people (laughs) at this point. Um, But I I think that if both partners in the marriage enter into decision-making with humility, then even the person who makes the final call is going to do so from a very different place than someone who is trying to control. And so um, that's actually a message that I would hope people on both sides of the decision can hear and and think about. The only thing I want to add is, I do know that you you can be in this feeling where you feel somewhat trapped in that situation, where I want to honor the Lord, but everything in me is going against what is happening here. And you can feel like, I don't don't even know what to do with everything I'm, I'm navigating right now. But we do have to do something with that, and that is the thing that is, what kind of what I was talking about earlier, that I can't change my spouse aspect, We serve a God who reigns over every single thing. He doesn't always make our husbands make the right choices. That's not going to happen. But we can entrust ourselves to the Lord. We can know that he sees us in that situation, even if it's a bad situation. Now, this is not talking about abusive. This is not talking about anything that is against what God's word would say. But like you were saying, in the realm of life, decisions that need to be made those are happening all of our marriage, you know, and there are times where I have disagreed with what my husband has decided he's going to do. We've talked about it. He's felt strongly. At that point, I have a decision. I can beat the nail over the head as much as I want, or I can say, okay, Lord, what have you called me to do? I can honor the Lord in my marriage without having the marriage I want to have, but I can't, I can't have a good marriage without honoring Christ. And so, Having those two reversed can make a whole lot of mess, Um, but these are situations, I think, that start to teach us that in really sometimes painful ways, Um, but ultimately praying, Lord, protect us in this, protect our marriage in this, protect my heart from growing resentful in this, Um, and ultimately, if this is not wise, I am asking you to intervene. I'm asking you to do that, and if not, help me trust you anyway. (laughs) I'd like a book recommendation. I've lived in a I've been married, it'll be 24 years in July. And we have developed a very unhealthy way of relating to one another, where many would say it's emotional abuse. And we're going through some steps right now to start to change that dynamic. But because of it's been so long, I don't even realize the way I think, my natural instincts just automatically go to an unhealthy place. Could you recommend any resources for a healthy, submissive wife, but yet not an unhealthy form of submission, especially when it comes to an addiction situation? I can be an enabler without thinking. I can make this easy for him. And we're trying to, he's, I've got to do as much work as he has to. And I need resources. Could you recommend, please? I would really urge you, if you're um, already to the place where you can acknowledge that this has deteriorated to an abusive situation, that you seek professional counsel. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just don't know that a book at this point is going to meet the needs that you're going to have to address. And I know that it may be that you're seeking counsel without him, or he may be going as well. But if you find yourself in that situation, 
It's really, um, uh, it's usually above the pay grade, so to speak, of the average person in ministry at the local church. You really should go and find um, the best help that you can to deal with that situation and get clarity on those relationship dynamics. I'm so sorry. That's a lot yeah. to deal with. Yeah. The only thing I would say is um, I do find a CCEF, the Christian Counseling Education Foundation, is that what it is? Um, they have a lot of great resources as well, um, and there's... I think there's there are publications that are creating and Jeff I don't know maybe you guys if you guys have any thoughts roaming through your head that you could maybe talk to them afterward they might have some suggestions for you that would be a little bit more practical for your situation. Um, my question is, what are some of the most helpful things people have said or done in your suffering, like in the local church? And what are some like strong do not say or do not do if you yeah, are? That's a great question. That. Yeah, because I feel like a lot of us want to help on the outside, but like in our church, I notice that we all fall silent because mm -hmm. we don't know what to say or do. I can. So mine is really fresh because we just had like last April. Um, so for us, for us, what was most helpful in the immediate was that people just showed up. Like they were, so I didn't have a lot of conversations with people where I needed to hear things from people, but for me, it was helpful. Like I'm texting you scripture or I'm going, I didn't, I, mean, I didn't have to make meals for like three months and cause my recovery was really long and bringing care packages for my kids. And, um, so I think things like that for us, it was really helpful in the immediate of like the tangible, um, practical help of not, you don't have to say anything sometimes, but I think sometimes people are afraid to say anything. So maybe I saw you after surgery or I saw you after you lost a baby and I, I, I hugged you and I cried with you and I said, I was praying for you. But then the next time I see you, I don't say anything. And the reality is that very often people are still thinking about the grief that they experienced. And so I think it's also helpful to not forget and so remember the due dates, remember the birthdays of the child that was lost, remember milestones of someone's surgery date or when they had a diagnosis. And I think long haul caring for people is a lot harder than uh, immediate caring for people. And I've been the most helped by people who have been with me over the long haul. And, and then honestly, like the reality is we're all going to say things we shouldn't say. If I, I mean, I still cringe about things I've said to people when I, I but on the back end, I'm like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have said that. And so I think sometimes going back to those people after you've said things, because you are going to say the wrong thing and you're going to say something that wasn't helpful in the moment, going back and saying, I'm sorry, I said that, I think is also helpful. So God can do a lot in our acknowledgement of saying the wrong thing, but, um, I think for, for me, it's always been helpful. Every person is different. So what helps one friend doesn't help another friend. But um, long haul for us has been really helpful. And then immediate just caring for whatever those needs are has been helpful. Um, yeah, one thing too, I think that um, we've especially navigated is because our one, at least one of our situations is very private or needs to be somewhat private um, due to the specifics of our child's needs. And so that makes it very lonely. And so I, we've had many, many people who, uh, well, you have two people. You have the ones that don't want to catch your suffering. And so they pretend nothing's happening. And then, or they say, have you prayed about it? Well, for 13 years, yes. Um, but sometimes those questions can be very hurtful um, if it's an indicating, I haven't done enough to fix this problem. So, and especially if it's spiritualized. Um, have you prayed in Jesus' name? Yes, I have. So it's just like those things can be, the, yeah, and I'm like, you know, it's just, it can be very confusing and it can inflict more pain on that person. However, there's also been wonderful people that have walked alongside of us the best that they can and they've learned to say, I don't even know what you need. I don't know how I can help you but I'm, I'm really hurting with you. I'm just, I'm grieving with you. Every time you pop in my mind, I think to pray for you. I don't even know what you need. I don't know how to help. Our situation is very hard to tangibly help. So people have used whatever gifts God's given them. Some have offered a meal. Some have sent just a card that says, look, your faith walking through this has encouraged my faith. To me, that has been the greatest gift to me. I'm like, oh, I see something God's doing in this. Nothing's fixed. No one's trying to fix it. I know no one can fix it.
but I can see there's something good coming out of it. Um, so that's been really encouraging. Or just someone saying, what can I do to help? But you know what's been the most blessing is people that just show up and they drop a meal off. They don't ask me how they can help. They don't ask me what I need. They just do it. Sometimes it's not the most practical thing I needed in the moment, but it still is a blessing to me because I'm like, they love me enough to do it. They, they're not even trying to get help from me to do it. They're just taking it all themselves. And when you're really under something heavy, it's really hard to ask for help. It's hard to reach out, especially when you don't even know how to ask for help. Our needs are so massive that it can feel like a drop in the bucket to ask for this kind of help. Um, and so having people that have entered into our life is like them saying, you haven't asked me, but I'm willing to enter into your mess with you, and I know it's gonna be uncomfortable, and I'm okay with that. That takes maturity, and it's the greatest gift. The flip side is I need to remember, no, nobody's gonna do this perfectly. I don't even know what I need the most. I cannot expect this person or this person or the church to know exactly what I need. So I also need to make sure I'm not looking at other people to meet those needs. Or that is when, like you were saying, like resentment and irritation and everyone else is the problem starts to come in. Um, and so having that grace to extend to the person that comes up and says, have you prayed about this before, is helpful to me because I don't let that sink down deep. I'm like, you know what, they, they really are probably not even ignorant, they're trying to help. I need to just, I've been there, I've been that person. And so extending that grace um, and, and then lastly, just asking for the Lord to bring those people um, to, to support you in the way that you need and knowing that group is often really small. There's small, really, really close, and then there's a bigger, kind of more vague, you know, um, and that as a further out those people go, it's gonna be less of an intense, intimate um, closeness in how they walk through that with you. But just making sure you offer that person one, the presence that you can give them, and then know that you're, you know, you see them. And just being seen is probably one of the greatest gifts you can give someone. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, I would just add a couple of things. One, I would avoid offering advice um, because people, yeah. especially when you have physical illnesses, everybody has like a magic charm that they have used or somebody has told them about it and they want you to try it. So I would say really be very prayerful about doing that. Um, I would. I would offer that. Um, also, a specific help is super helpful. Like, yeah. hey, I love to do laundry. I'm free Wednesday at noon. Can I fold your clothes? Like, I can say yes to that, or I can say, hey, maybe Thursday. But mm -hmm. if you know, if you want to say, call me anytime, they're not going to call you. I mean, and if you know that they're not going to call you, and you're just saying it to be nice, that's fine. But if you actually want to help, I mean, I've done that, you know, if I know that I really don't have anything I can help with. But if you really want to help, think about what you can do. Like, I love to garden. I'd love to weed your garden. I mean, whatever it is, but be super specific with a super specific day is very helpful because people can respond to that. And then um, the last thing is just ask, how are you doing today? I think how are you doing is such a huge question, especially with whatever you're going through. That's a really hard answer. But how are you doing today is very specific, so you can answer just in the minutia of however you want to. But I think, as we've all said, it's important to feel seen, that people know that something's hard is going on. So don't, if you see them in the grocery store, don't avoid them, don't go the other way, because they see that you have gone the other way. So I'd say, yeah, just lean in. Yeah, yeah. Those are really good. Um, so we want to make sure you get to the next session. So I am, I'm going to pray, but if you have questions, you can always come talk to us as well. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray and close this out. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we are so thankful that, uh, that you draw near that you are near to the brokenhearted and that you save the Christian spirit. So Lord, I just ask that you would draw near to every single woman in this room um, in their suffering, in the specific needs. Lord, uh, the needs uh, that we all face are insurmountable for us to fix and insurmountable for us to care for one another, but they're not for you. And so we ask that these women would feel and know your nearness and know that you are um, a God who is strong and who delivers and who cares for your people. And we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen.